I'm very glad to have been invited to this forum and also to meet my friend uh, Thomas uh, because we've done very many things together <laughs> and also our friends uh, in this very important uh, discussion. So my name is uh, Nwaga Bogasta Sazi Abin and we have been working very hard to ensure that this Uganda can be like other countries which you all like. So the topic is the paradox of democracy in commercialized politics and I'm, I'm, I want to apologize. I've, I've, I've just been at church at St. Francis Macquarie. We had a very big uh, ceremony with the Archbishop and we had the confirmation of which I was a good parent of many of the, of the children. So that's precisely why I came a little, just a little minutes late. So let's have uh, quick thoughts. And uh, the first one is the emergence of a democratic uh, political thought. The, of course, the ancient political thought, as you know, was based on Greek and Roman thought. The, the, the major proponents is Socrates arguing that, of course, politics should achieve practical results. That, that's what the initial uh, thinkers thought. And also they thought that politics should be built on ethical systems. There, would be, there should be ethics driving practical results. And they also thought that there were only two words. If you look at Socrates' work, you look at Plato's work, you look at Aristotle's work, and the entire uh, political realm, they are thinking of knowledge and ignorance. And they thought that the only good thing that politics should drive is really humanism based on reason. That therefore politics should be on ethics, should be on practical results, and should be based on reason to drive good. And those who read the Bible, this is in, in, in also in, in Psalms, in David's Psalms, especially I love normally 37. And I can recite it here, one to four. It says, do not fret because of evil men. No do wrong because you are seeing other people doing wrong and you are envious of those who are doing wrong. For like they will wither, like morning dew, they will dry away. So try to do good. So it is entirely therefore the same. The same we are, we, are, we are just looking here. Let's continue. Now, this one we are saying that uh, if we look at John Rocky and what we call the famous Rocky and politics, is that of course now they start coming in economics. John Rocky brings in economics and he argues that of course politics should move with the property. And when I came here, my brother was exactly on that. It was issues of life. Liberty and property comes in. Now, and this is very interesting. When property comes in, of course, Professor Mamadan will tell you that the vote, therefore, is going to be cast in the market. That's why you, are, you cannot go to politics unless you really have money. Those who have been in the U.S., I can see here you go to politics because you want to get money from parliament. But in the in U.S., they want to first see your bank account, how much money is there. Those who are just going, you are finishing Makerere and the other university, and then you want to go to politics to get a job. Others are going there because they want to serve. And this is very bad news, if, if the situation here, which is not, nothing other than the situation here. So this concurs, of course, with the politics, which will be based on aesthetics. This was Professor Apollon Sivambi. He, he, he used a very, very high frequency of this word. Ethics and virtue. Those are the three major things. And if you remember the entire life of Professor Ponsibambi, he was on politics, which are really based on aesthetics. In other words, he was fond of the word political hygiene, if you remember Professor Ponsibambi. He was on political hygiene. Do we have political hygiene? In fact, I remember when Professor Mujaju died, you know, he, he, we had a, a, terrible, a, a terrible situation at Makerere. Professor Akik Mujaju one of the fathers of political science at Makerere got an accident and when we were at his Requiem Mass in St. Francis during the question which Professor Sibambi told us that he had asked 
when Professor Mujaju stood, like I stood at, at in, in Kabari municipality, and I, I told Thomas Tayevka here, I, I know it almost got to zero. The whole professor of economics. <laughs> because I did not know what to tell people in, in, in Kabari municipality. For me, I thought that politics was based on reason and aesthetics and virtue. Politics is not based on aesthetics, it's not based on reason, it's not based on virtue. I almost got to zero to, 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 to <laughs> And, I, and I, I came, I told the president, the mayor almost got to zero. And I was saying things which politics should be talking about. These are not things people want to hear, my brothers and sisters. And this is very bad news, therefore, for Uganda. Just the point number one, which Professor Nwaga, what is Professor Nwaga said here this afternoon, that your politics is not based on virtue, it is not based on aesthetics, it is not based on reason. If it was based on reason, we, we should be the ones in the parliament. We should be the ones driving the parliament. But if a professor stands and you want to tell them exactly what you should be telling them, not what they want in economics, we call it normative economics. Because we have positive economics and normative economics. Normativism means to tell somebody something, not the right thing, but the thing which that person wants to hear. Whether it is bad or not, unfortunately in Uganda, they don't want to hear <laughs> what that, that which you, you, you need to tell them. So that's why you must go to zero. And I've not gone back. And therefore do not ask the, the, the reason why. <laughs> therefore, all ancient political thought was based on one common denominator. And this was doing good for the polity using ethical and virtuous systems. And I can repeat it. Doing good using ethical and virtual systems. This is what has run countries. This is what has run countries. And therefore, don't also ask why certain countries have developed quite faster. Others have developed slowly, but have also developed, while for us who have remained behind. This is absolutely one common denominator. There is nothing it is. And this is what I've said this afternoon today. Even if you don't listen to anything else, I've said that politics is central for economic transformation. I've not said, you listen, Professor Nwagab has not said that democracy is important for transformation. No. That's not what I've said. I've said that politics is very, very important for transformation. Let me say it in a better way. Governance. In fact, good governance is extremely important for economic and social transformation. And if you invite me here, I would elaborate on that matter. We don't have time to elaborate on that matter. So I'm going to now to, 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 di to, to di I mean, uh, dissect uh, two types of politics. Countries that have developed, countries that have recently transformed, including Taita, South Korea, and, and uh, General Park Changi, the, uh, the Lee Kuan Yew in Singapore, Muhammad Gandhi in India, uh, tried, who took India to be among the G10. We have got Sase Wasegura Mugran in, 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 in Mauritius. Mauritius now is a developed country. Then you have uh, Idamini here, you have President Museveni here, you have all, all, all these people. Uh, all categorized under those two. We have 202 of them. President Arani Garcia in Peru, Jinping. Number one is that politics derives from political power, which can be used either as a domination or as liberation. Number two, politics can drive conflict or build peace and coexistence. Also, you should be seeing where your country lies. Among those, again, number two. Number one, you see where power here, whether it is used as domination or whether it is liberation. Number three, power can be top down. Power can be participatory. In Uganda, where do you lie? In the US, where do they lie? In Singapore, where do they lie? In South Korea, where do they lie? Or our donors, where do they lie? And our recipients of these donations, where do we lie? Number four, power can be secretive. It can be corrupt. Or it can be transparent and clean. Where do you lie? And number five, power can be hierarchical. Power can be egalitarian. Like you know, the British colonial state came here with the Captain Rugadi in 1994. He was here in Arudu Kampara. You, you see, the Uganda, this Uganda where we are, behaved differently from, for example, Asaba Chigeni Kabali. 
you cannot equate us with Uganda here. Even when you look at the Waland question, you see our relationship with the property. It's quite different from the relationship with the property in Uganda. And the president is quarreling. You have read, you read his letter yesterday. And I mean, he came in 1975 with the land reform decree. Why? Because of the different structure and systems the British colonial state built here, especially through the, 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 the Buganda agreement. On that, on that issue, in Kabar and, and Kigeza, we are very, very egalitarian. But other communities like here are extremely hierarchical, and therefore they are, they, they are very, very quickly to mobilize. And I'm liking this, 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 this. If we had used these kingdoms very well, you look at things like vaccination. You just go to Bulanga and see how many people appeared in only two minutes to be vaccinated, as compared to when, for example, a minister of, of, of health calls people to be vaccinated. These are the things we are talking about. How many can those two call in the five minutes, and how many will they get, each of them? Number five, power can be autocratic, power can be accountable. We also can have gentle authoritarianism. And therefore, can drive different results. So I want to leave that discussion there, and then you will be able to, 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 to exactly examine yourself and see where you are. But in Uganda, as a case, let's look at the political behavior deriving from those two. Do you have transactionists or do you have transformatists? Do you have transformative politics or do you have transactional politics? Countries that have had transformative politics, in case I don't have time, sufficient time, is that they have tended to develop faster than even those who are very, very highly democratic. With the democratic uh, parliaments that you have, which can, in, you can do you, did you know that you can eventually end up having parliamentary dictatorship? You can easily go into parliamentary dictatorship, you are not careful. So are you looking for what? A ballot here, of course, is cast in the market, as you all know. I, I see my brother here was talking about, uh, I don't want to tell you the amount of money I spent. I stood in the, in, in the NRM uh, primaries. I stood in the national general elections. So do you just, if you tell me the amount of money I spent, I would have, 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 have purchased a building on Kampara Road and added on my other buildings. In fact, if I was not firm, I don't know whether my wife would have divorced or, or, or whether I would still be having a family. I know families where they have lost their marriages because they are of spending this money. If you are not firm, you can really be in, 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 in trouble. Why? Because the ballot is gas in the market and political participation has been relegated to market forces of demand and supply. We are really in the market. Can you imagine that? Just really in the market. And in, even in the line, people are just giving money in, in, in people in the line. Open air purchase of votes, provision of commodities to electorate. And I'm sure, Thomas, you have not bought one. I'm Julian says, Is this your work? Is this the work of member of parliament to buy ambulances, to build loads and electricity? These are infrastructure with the role of government. But because of the relegation of politics to the actual market, all of these have been relegated now to, to, to the market. And for the forces of demand and supply, let's go to economics class now. If you take politics to the demand and supply forces, then you do not complain. Because for us, the way the indifference curve works is that first of all, the indifference curve cannot cross another. One will never cross another. The consumption will meet production at a price which will be determined by the amount of person the money you have. The, the moment there are two loaves of bread in the market, the prices will be up if you come for people wanting the same loaves of bread. If eight people come and the loaves, the loaves of bread now have increased to 30, the bread will come down automatically. Why? Because the person who is selling you bread doesn't want the bread to go bad. The forces of supply have been a factor overrun. Demand. So the moment the demand overruns the supply, prices will go up. But if supply 
overrun the demand, prices will go down. So don't expect, don't expect therefore politics to be cheaper if it still has a very, very high demand in a very, very market forces way that this money will come down at all. Let's move. I have, uh, uh, so I talk to members of parliament, very many of them. Uh, uh, about Thomas Taibu as friends, and most of them spent about 650 million. You are talking about 400 million. I don't want to tell you what, uh, how much I spent. <laughs> this is a municipality. <laughs> this is a municipality. So some of you may be coming from up country. This may be you are better. But for us, like a municipality, covering municipality, because it's a municipality for the portal, you, you need to talk to those people and tell you how they have suffered. It is there. This is a member of parliament who is in, 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 in parliament now. This one here. Let's move. You have seen his testimony. Let's go quickly, please. Adoption of full brown liberal economic policy was the what were the cause of this? Professor Nwagaba, why did we slide to this level? Is that number one, we are running a government which is based on neo liberal <coughs> economic policy of 150%. As you all know, we don't have cooperatives. We used to have cooperative alliance. We used to have cooperative <coughs> bank. We used to study some of us with IOU. My mother used to sell me vegetables. I sell it to, them, to the cooperative union in Kabali. Kigesu growers. Bugisu growers. This one of Nanda number five. Uh, there is Uganda growers and Masaka and so on. All of those things used to help us. But once the economy was liberalized, that you can sell anything you want at any time, then you don't start complaining. This required, in many countries, where well, don't ask a professor whether the other countries do not have liberal economic policies. They do. But once you have a liberal economy, then you have very strong regulation. Those countries have very, very strong regulation. But because why? There is a self-motive incentive as opposed to public good. Now, that's why Nyerere said you cannot have democracy unless you have what? Democrats, if the public goods give way to private self-motive incentive, the public good definitely will die. And they don't complain. So the public good will give way, just will carve in. And then the private motive incentive drives the process. And that's what has happened here. Because when we adopted the liberal economic policy, what we, we required was very, very heavy regulation. And that's why I want to congratulate here at this particular moment. I want to congratulate certain institutions here. And one of them is the central bank. You have to congratulate our central bank. 25 commercial banks. But the central bank really regulates them. Otherwise, if they were left now, everybody to do what he likes, like we are doing in other sectors, you, you would not manage. You would not manage to get any, any loan from a bank. But the central bank brings a very heavy regulation. This is what should have happened in all sectors. In education, in health. So that you just don't establish a school. You just don't establish a, a, a clinic. You just don't establish a pharmacy. Very heavy regulation. Another point, other point I want to, to actually congratulate the, 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 the council, the medical council. It sort of so tries to, to regulate at these private clinics. We have not had very many problems of the, the, the health workers that you have got an injection which is a fake. It is there, but, but really not. We cannot, we cannot say it is, a, it is a disaster. So now there was number two, erosion of ethics, <coughs> which gave way to greed because of the member of the lack of regulation and the unchecked political power resulting in a primitive accumulation of capital. Primitive Kabisa. You find somebody has 100 cars packed in the compound. He's, he's proving a point, probably. You, do you know fixation in psychology? Those who are taught by Professor Polod. If you are fixated, you are trying to catch up with the things you lacked in the past. That's why I see all the men trying to drive toys. If your father didn't have money to, to, to buy you toys, you, you can buy a man of 70 years and you are driving, just driving these toys. You are my man of 60, like me and the Tayabuga here, and you find we are in this, in, we are dancing ourselves and the whole morning. You are dancing, showing all styles of dancing. Because we, we didn't have it. That kind of person is normally fixated. And this is the problem we have.
because people have been grown in poverty. You don't find this in the U.S. You don't. I was in Canada. I was in Canada and I was, I, I was uh, visiting our, our friend uh, Munini Mulera. I was just going for my usual work. But I had a problem of river. So I said, why don't I go to, to, to I just drove, we drove from to, 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 uh, Ottawa to Toronto. Toronto is like here for Kampara to, Toronto is actually like Soro. It's very, very far. I reached there. I, the, the, when I was traveling, you don't find any house with, with, with the, uh, uh, these perimeter walls you have. Houses are in a stadium. And there is no burglar proof. Why? When I asked Munini Murera, what did he tell me? Why, why do we have burglar proof? Because everybody is the same. What, we, what, what do you want to steal from that house and sell it to who? Same in, in New Zealand, same in Australia, same in Denmark. The best one is Sweden, Netherlands, and all of those uh, uh, social democratic countries. Social democracy. Let's now go to social democracy. Finland, where the teacher, second teacher school teacher, is the one who paid the highest in the, in, the, in the country. Do you see how economies are run? That uh, if you want very highly democratic. Denmark, the best country which is taxed in the whole world. 65%, you earn 1 million shillings, 650 is a tax. You earn 100 million shillings, 650 is a tax. You go to, to, to Copenhagen and meet and tell, tell me whether anybody has ever complained. Why? Because the, everybody wants to pay tax. Why? Because the tax is used properly. These are countries that are called social democratic countries, social democracy. Everybody is the same. There is equality in economics, there is economic solidarity. It's neo, it, it, it's liberalism. It is not socialism, but is where people do business and then the taxes trickle down to the rest of the people. And therefore, everybody is a policeman. There is nobody get it from me in Denmark who has ever evaded the tax. Tariyo is not there because everybody is a policeman. Why? Because everywhere where there is an ambulance. We were in the suburb one time. The girl was picked by an ambulance, which is an aircraft, from here at the suburb airport. And if you were a person a Danish, would you fail to pay tax there? You look at this graph now, as opposed to what happened. This is a Ugandan graph. You may not understand it. It is in the Muzungu Rwafe. It is in our language. But let me speak about it in English language. Just, it's, in, it's an economic model. But let me bring, talk about in English language. That, num, that, that, that graph, the, what you see, is saying very, very simple English. That in Uganda, 10% of the population in Uganda, of, of 45 million people, control toward 36% of the wealth. That all the wealth we generate, $45 billion. We have $45 billion our GDP. We have just rebased it. It's controlled by that, 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 that small number of people. And that problem, the, the, lowest, the, lowest, <laughs> the lowest 10% is, 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 is really, really suffering, as you can see. They are controlling 2.5%. The wealth is between only if you want 4 million people. And you can mention their names. In fact, those million, those four, is a statistic. If parametrically, if you go into, into parameters, it's about six to ten people whom you know very well their names even. And that problem is growing at 21 percent. You see that negative 21.1 means that that problem is increasing at the rate of every 20 people, every 100 or so suffer from that. This is terrible. This is not good at all. Even by the way, this is not good for for business, it's not good for politics, Honorable uh, uh, Thomas. It is one which brings that. Do you see what comes from it now? Crowds out scientific reason, and then the politics creates room for unsuitable people to ascend to political positions. This is what happens. Number two, chaos. And you have been asking about violence in Africa. Don't ask stupid questions, which, which are un unattainable. If you have four people dominating the entire wealth, that's what my brother here was talking about. What do you expect? You expect peace? 
Even those who have drivers, you just have a driver, let me teach you. And you go and eat chicken, come from, uh, they come, hey, let's go. Is that the way you, 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 you should treat your driver? The same certain countries that you treat their, their populations. Wealth is dominated by few. You eat well, you sleep well, and this is how you treat your house girls as well. For you, eat chicken and what? The house girls eat sports and dinner, which was even last night, as if she's an animal. You are all people in the same house. You think for her she doesn't have human rights? She's not a person. She doesn't have blood like you. People have some countries, let me tell you, organize themselves and everybody has the same blood like the other. Others, if you want to have blood alone, do you see what will happen to you? It is in South Sudan, it is in Somalia, it is going to Ethiopia, among the Tigrians. It has been here, you have had an enough share of yours. I hope you don't want, by God's sake, to come that you have another share. We have had enough share. But you, are, you can see you are continuing. You don't mind how much money I'm earning. I was the other day fighting President Museveni, you saw me. In Makerere, we were earning 470,000. I was chairman of all of those professors. I told President Museveni I cannot accept this, that I will earn as a professor in Wagaba, I don't know how many degrees. I will earn 470,000. Honorable Thomas, you were there. And then somebody in, 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 in town has never got any single degree. He's earning 40 million. He's also an economist. I'm an economist. I told President Museveni I can't allow that. I told him I can't allow that. We went to State House, we argued, I was with Bita Mazira at that time, he was our minister, Professor Sibambi, Kale Kihura, Gerard Karuanga was there, he was the Gawagiri president, we were there. Tamiria Chamba, there was a secretary. We fought in the State House, at the only time the president abandoned us, I thought he was going to come and, and I said, but I said, I mean, his house, I mean, where, where do I run it to? I said, I remain here. And I told the president, please, can we have two things? Eventually, they contracted me, actually. The government contracted me to do two things. One, to transform public service, which I did. And the owner of the table is here. The paper is there. It is called transformation of public service. I proposed two things. One, harmonization of salaries and remuneration. Number two, moratorium on public vehicles. These are public vehicles you see. Just a nuisance. Many countries did away with them a long time ago. And you can save, do you know the amount of money we save on this government? Because 1.2 trillion shillings, Thomas, in case we didn't know. This is the money you are looking for. This is the money they are looking for. They are looking for 3.8 trillion now in, in, in supplementary budget. They, they cannot raise that money. What they are going to do is squeeze budgets. They will raise about 1.2 only from that. The 2.7, something is going to be on treasury bills. In the Bank of Uganda, they will sell you treasury bills. Do you know what that will do? It will do two things. One, it will drive interest rates. So for us in the private sector, we shall go to banks. Banks do not have money. Banks are the ones who we, we are normally going to buy these, these treasury bills. You know you can do not deal with the central bank. You deal with them through what you call PDs, primary dealers, Stanbeek, the Babusa, the Bank of Baroda, the Antropical Bank recently, and so on. The, the bank will prefer to lend the government. It can not lend a professor. Why? Because the professor is risky. But if I can lend the government, the government is, is very, very robust. It is a government, and it is never risky. So banks will prefer to lend government. If I go to stand big bank, no money now there. Why, Anna Juku? The money will lend to government. If, but, do you, but there is some money which we left with. Can you accept 20% interest rate? Can you imagine 20% interest rate? In China, money is free. 0.00067%. That's why you see their companies are the ones winning all the tenders. Don't ask stupid questions. They are the ones who winning tenders. Why? Because you don't have money. So government borrowing is not good, so it doesn't promote uh, equality. Because we shall go there, and there is no money. And then number two is that it will create a government which is very, very dependent. And then it squeezes the population. Where are you going to get the 2.3 trillion, sir? From these people who are just coming out of COVID. And we are paying school fees. But the governor, they will come on, on Wednesday. They'll be wanting 2.3 trillion from us in government papers. 
So we shall have therefore transactional politics as opposed to transformative one. Countries like Denmark, those are social democrats. Let me explain them again. Don't confuse countries. Denmark, Finland, Sweden, Netherlands, those are the countries on the world class. These are world class countries. They have social democracy. For their democracy is people to be the same. That's why you can't find there a thief. That's why you go to their prison and people prefer to go to prison in Sweden, for example, get it from me rather than being in your home. They commit, they commit very simple probably simple uh, crimes. So that he's in a prison in Sweden. Why? A prison in Sweden is better than your homes, most of them. These are countries where we want to be. Imagine a country having a prison that is better than you, you, your home, which you build it, of course, with the money you store. But still is better. These are countries which are very serious. And they are called social democrats. Why? For them, they earn money. Everybody has the same, almost the same. They, let's be, if you want me to be more technical, let's go to economics again. They are, they are Gini coefficient. Gini coefficient is the index that measures how we are different economically. If I'm putting on a shoe of, of winner classic of, of about two, two million, you are putting on a shoe of 200,000, I'm 10 times you. If I put a winner suit, winner classic of 3 million, you are putting in a trousers of, of, of a win of, of, of 30,000, I'm 30 times you. How do you run a country like that? Somebody putting on a suit 30 times you. You will definitely have a civil conflict. Peace and stability is coming from failure to, to, to have peace and stability and also equality. And these differences cannot drive with you. You have South Sudan, you have Nigeria, the Christian animists always fighting with the Muslims in the, in the, in the, in the, in the north. So you have your Kanos and the Kadunas that are always fighting. With, with, with the, these are the Kunulis, general, the Kunulis of Uruwari. Who is fighting with the, 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 the Christian animists? So Sudan, same. Why? Because people are thinking that this is our time also for eating. That's how politics is defined. So the red flag, uh, as I finish, is one, Uganda remains a geographical entity. In fact, yesterday I was talking to my friends in Eritrea and also in other countries. And they, are, they cannot believe the, the peace which is here and the liberalism and the politics and the way you can do your business and so on. They said, wow. They said, this, how, the, how you can have such a government? I said, yes, our government is like that. It gives everybody to do whatever he wants. And But I told him also it has its own problems. If you live here, you will also see. And that's what the Baganda say. And for us, we have to take the agenda. That in English language, the boy who doesn't uh, uh, move, yes, I'm finishing, thank you, thinks that her mother is the one who cooks well. You need to know what happens in other countries. But obviously, we are better than also other countries. Number two, we have uh, a national consciousness, patriotism, patriotism ethos, national value system. This is what I want the government here to take. Some of us who travel, God has given us a little bit uh, favor. We travel, we met, meet serious people, we talk to serious audiences, and so on and so forth. And we cut our heads high. If you come from a good country, which people are talking about, I don't want to travel. I'm arriving in New York, I arrive in Beijing, I arrive in London, I arrive in, 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 in Botswana here, and so on. And then we are a laughing stock. Nobody wants that. So we need, we need uh, uh, Thomas, a national consciousness. Oh, do you have a consciousness? And I think this is what I've said I think, this afternoon. What have I said? What have I said? Professor Nwagaba said, Uganda, you need a national consciousness. You need a national value system. You need a national ethos where we can define ourselves as Ugandans. And then you can travel with your head high. Not as a Muchiga, not as a Mutoro, not as a Munyankuri, not as a Nacholi, not as a... And this is why I like Nigerians. 
He was in Abuja about two weeks ago, three, three weeks ago. <coughs> and it is very hard to find, with all the problems in Nigeria, with all the problems they have, but he's, he's a Nigerian, especially when you meet him outside. But for you, you meet, I, I, I was contracted by UN in this COVID. I was in Manchester, I was in Leeds, I was at Old Trafford, we had a football match, remember Liverpool, and I was in Leeds, I conducted many meetings in London, I was in Amsterdam one day. But people want still to call themselves Batoro. The, but then I was asking, what have you done if you are Mutoro? What have you done if you are Mochiga? What have you done if you are Nacholi? Why don't we define ourselves? The UN had told me to do one thing, to map what your children are doing in the diaspora. And I did that. It is actually $1.7 billion, the money I mapped. And I came here, I told the Bank of Uganda, this is $1.7 billion. But this is the same money we, we have spent on Karuma Dam. Then why did we borrow? Yeah, I told the Bank of Uganda, if you had established a diaspora bond, and these people accepted, you, you make them to love Uganda as their country. Because most of them don't also. Women, you cannot tell the names here. But I heard very many meetings. In Amsterdam, in London, in Leeds, in Manchester, you really see that some of them really don't clearly market Uganda. Don't. And I was trying to convince them, come and we have a diaspora bond. It's only Nigeria which has established a diaspora bond. I told them, do you think Nigeria doesn't have differences? But they know how to treat their differences. And also they know how differences cannot stop development in that process. So it is only Nigeria, let me repeat it, out of the 54 African countries who have established a diaspora bond. The diaspora bond is money which you can all establish when you are like working outside your country, put in one basket, come, and we sponsor Karuma Dam. Karuma Dam was $1.7 billion. These boys and girls make $1.7 billion in London. I even convinced your ambassador, our ambassador at, at, at Trafalgar Square. I heard a very big meeting with him. I told him, can't we establish a, a bank here at Trafalgar? So that we, 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 since many trains, Piccadilly, those who understand London, come even from Manchester to here, Edinburgh to here, intercity southwest from East Coast trains, Norwich to here, we can now marshal this money here, and then we have a diaspora bond, and I think he took up the matter. If you can come to take up matter with the president, we can establish a diaspora bond and reduce some of the debt of some of these infrastructures. You see, Madam, we could have sponsored that very, very quickly. That's what Ethiopia has done with the Renaissance Dam. And it's six thousand megawatts, it's ten times ours of Karuma. It's six gigahertz. And don't ask, therefore, why the cost of their electricity is, is like eight percent of the cost of electricity here. Don't ask stupid questions. Because their dam now is cheaper, has been a very, very, very cheaply costed, and also cheaply constructed. Ours, the, 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 the loan is very expensive. So don't expect electricity to be cheaper here. And for us in private business, therefore, don't expect to have our commodity cheaper. The commodity will not be cheaper. So as we finish, therefore, uh, I think we need the national dialogue. I think the country can, I don't want to use a, to use a, 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 an inappropriate word, but it's a country which needs sorrow searching. Let me finish like this. What has Professor Nwagaba said? That under neoliberal economic policy, let me build my golden thread and, and sit. Let me build my golden thread. It is a country which is a blessed country. You all know that. But potential resources which are not exploited are as useless as water in the tap, which was cut by national water. That water cannot help you. Somebody needs to open the tap and water comes, and that's how Uganda is. Uganda is a country which is just like water in the tap. You need somebody to come and just open that tap. You don't need anything much. Number two, I have said, it's a liberal economic policy model, which we cannot change. Uganda here, we have had a history of economic policies where we don't have, we don't quickly go to policy reversals. Don't expect this policy to change. So what we need, uh, Thomas, is very heavy regulation. Countries which are serious have the same economic policy, but they have very heavy regulation. And then I've also said, number three, last, that you need a national consciousness, build a national value system, 
with a national ethos where you also get proud as a Ugandan. You don't want people to talk about your country badly. Neither do you want your family to, to, to talk about your family badly. Let other people to be the only talk about Uganda badly, but not us. Thank you. So let me end with the...